I'm turning this classic roguelike from the GBA era into a fully 3D experience. In the last video, we laid the foundation for the game world and implemented several ways of generating roguelike dungeons. Now, we're going to take the output maps from these generators and use them to build the 3D mesh we'll use to actually display our game. First things first, we need to make a mesh class that stores the following. The vertex count, an integer that tells us how many points make up the mesh. The vertex positions, a float array that contains the XYZ coordinates of each vertex. The texture coordinates, another float array that contains the UV chords of each vertex. And the indices, an integer array that basically works as an instruction manual for OpenGL, telling it how to assemble the mesh from the previous arrays. We also need to create a few methods to help us with the building and manipulation of the mesh, like merging meshes, offsetting them on world space, and altering the UV coordinates. This allows us to piece the level together similar to a jigsaw puzzle. This approach also allows us to reduce the number of draw calls we're making in our renderer. Now, we're going to build a rudimentary system for assembling our dungeon using cubes, giving it sort of a Wolfenstein 3D style map. Now, I don't really want to call it a Vox renderer since the tile map's only 2D, so I'm not gonna. So anyways, to get the renderer started, we're gonna make a class called Render Tiles, and in that class, we're gonna have a static function called Draw, taking the dungeon map and tile coordinates as inputs. Then, we're gonna add another static function called Draw Cube with the same inputs. In the Draw function, we're gonna first check and see if the tile is solid. If it's not, we're just going to draw a flat square with a height of zero, which will be our ground. If it's solid, we go to draw a cube. The naive approach would just be place a cube at the input coordinates and call it a day. But 17-year-old me knew that such an approach was a terrible idea even back when I was still using immediate mode rendering. So we're going to add some calling methods to make sure that we don't render faces that are touching other tiles. Doing this is pretty simple. We just checked if the neighbor tiles are solid and only add a face if it's not. And with that out of the way, we've got a nice base for our dungeon renderer. But enough about rendering cubes, this is not a voxel or wolfenstein devlog. I want the tiles of this dungeon to be more complex, more high poly, more... third adjective. First things first, I'm going to start by modeling out some rock meshes for the stone walls in our dungeon. Now, since our dungeons are randomly generated, we need to make sure there's a mesh for each orientation the rock tile can generate in. Since we're using a square base grid, each tile has eight neighbors that can influence its orientation. The four cardinal directions and the four diagonal directions. While this adds up to a possible of 256 orientations, only 47 need unique meshes. But there's a problem with that. In the last episode, we defined three solid tiles that would need complex meshes. Even assuming no more tiles are added to the game, that's 141 meshes that need to be modeled out. Not only does that mean a lot of time invested in modeling each tile, but it means each tile is going to take up a load of disk space for each orientation. Right now, each mesh takes less than 2 kilobytes since I'm just banging out some programmer art meshes. But as development progresses and the tiles grow more complex, the final models are probably going to be closer to 20 or 30 kilobytes. This so might not seem like a lot, but remember that my goal is to keep this game under 100 megabytes. So before I commit to modeling dozens of tile variants, let's break things down and look at where we can optimize our workflow. First, we can rotate our meshes. This alone cuts the amount of models we need to make from 47 to 12, reducing things to under 2 megabytes. Second, we could break each tile into sub-tiles, similar to how 8 and 16-bit games broke their tiles up. This further reduces our workload to a mere 4 meshes per tile, turning our original 7.5 megabytes into 150 kilobytes. Remember that optimizing a game isn't just about writing good code, it's about knowing when and how to reuse assets to save space and reduce how many disk reads you perform. It doesn't matter whether you're using 4 sub-tile meshes or 47 tile meshes. So now that we've got these subtiles, how do we figure out when we're supposed to use them? The naive approach would be to go through a nested tree of if statements, but this leads to a lot of redundant checks. The next best approach would be to store the array of these tiles locally, but we could do even better and store all the necessary data in a single variable. To do this, let's create an integer called mask. Starting from the northwest tile, we're going to check to see if that space is occupied by a tile. 
and add a binary directional value to mask if it is. So if the northwest tau is solid, we add a 1. If the north tau is solid, we add 2. Then 4 for the northeast tau, and so on. This leaves us with a number between 0 and 255 that could be used to tell us what subtiles we're using in each corner. Now this could have been done by having a lookup table that tells what subtiles you used. Both 255 entries needed, that would be a very long and drawn out solution. What I realized, however, is each quadrant only really cares about three of the eight neighbors. So I made four functions that check the bits of the four quadrants and then return the relevant mesh. If you're curious about how this works, basically a bit shift mask to the left by the position of the desired bit, then bitwise and the number with one to tell whether it's a one or a zero. If it's one, we know it represents a solid tile. We could further simplify this by creating a lookup table for the addresses of the relevant bits, meaning we only need a single function for getting the subtiles, saving us over 250 lines of code. Nice! Would have been nice if I came up with that before I wrote four different quadrant checks, but maybe I just had to get Miyagi'd. So let's pop that into the generator and... Okay, so there's still some work to do. Fortunately for the first three corners, we could just offset and rotate them using a simple lookup table. But for the wall segments, we need to run one more check to tell whether the wall should connect to the neighbor on the X or Y axis, then rotate accordingly and apply the offset. Much better. But you'll notice the UVs are incorrectly applied on some of the tiles. To fix this, we'll be offsetting the UV coordinates in certain parts using translate UV at which is a function that offsets the texture coordinates for a specific range of vertices. There we go. We'll follow a similar workflow for the brick walls of the dungeon rooms, but for the door tiles, we're going to substitute the four quadrant approach for a simpler one. The door tile will use a single archway model, and it will be oriented depending on whether it has two solid neighbors on the x-axis or y-axis. If one of the neighbors is destroyed by one of digging, the doorway will be destroyed as well. While I'm here, however, I should probably bring up another time and space saving measure I've taken to optimize things. What's currently scrolling on the screen is the OBJ file data for one of these tile segments. Now, OBJ is a super simple and easy to use format, but there's a few issues. First, the file is stored in plain text, easy to read, and really useful for tweaking stuff, but it's not perfect. For vertex data, we use 17 to 20 characters per position, plus one extra byte for the inline character. For texture data, we use 12 characters per UV, plus that extra inline byte. Now, float variables are a 32-bit number, or 4 bytes of data. So if a vertex has 3 floats for the XYZ coordinates, we should be saving it as 12 bytes, right? But due to the plain text encoding, we have an extra 5 to 8 bytes per vertex position and 3 to 4 bytes per UV. So that's an average 229 extra bytes. It's worth noting too that most models don't use decimal precision of 3, they use decimal precision of 6. So if this stone wall was using the higher precision, that's 28 to 31 bytes per vertex and 20 bytes per UV, or 470 extra bytes. And I do use that higher precision in this game since we're using a texture atlas. So to help crunch the file size, I wrote this little converter program based on the OBJ loader written by ThinMatrix. What it does is load the OBJ file, parse all the vertex, texture, and index data, and save it as a binary string. So each vertex is stored as 12 bytes, each UV is stored as 8 bytes, and each triangle is stored as between 6 and 12 bytes. This reduces our file size by around 60%. I'll be taking it a step further by compressing the files using the gzip compression method, which is thankfully built into the Java I.O. system. So this takes the original file size of this mesh from 1.3 kilobytes to 180 bytes. For a larger example, we can take this hospital model by Quaternius and reduce the size from 219 kilobytes down to 21.9. Finally, there's one more thing I want to add. Let's take the getNeighbor function and add a boolean argument called layer. If layer is true, we'll be generating our mask using solid tiles. If it's false, we'll instead generate it using tiles that extend beneath the dungeon floor, such as fluid tiles or pitfall traps. Now let's mirror the Y coordinates and UV positions of the cave wall meshes, giving us a nice empty basin for our lake. We'll then bring back the water plans, lowering them slightly beneath the floor. 
Next, we'll blend in a second instance of the water texture that's set to scroll diagonally. And we're going to apply a bit of texture warping using this function in the GLSL shader to make it a bit more lively. So we've gone from these charmingly simple GBA graphics to this 3D dungeon. And while the meshes aren't really that detailed or, well, good per se, the system's flexible enough that the meshes can be swapped out without needing to rewrite the code. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like. It really helps a lot. And if you want to keep up to date on the game's development, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell, because in the next video we're going to start working on the entity system, creating a player avatar to properly explore the dungeons, as well as some basic monsters to fight. Finally, I recently opened up a Patreon for my channel. If you've been liking the videos so far and want to further support my development of the Ashes Quest or any other projects I'm working on, the link to that will be in the description. Also linked is the Ashes Quest Discord server. I've actually had this set up for a while, but I never really advertised it since I've mostly been uploading content through the roguelike developer discord, but it exists and I'll be using it much more to post content about the game. Anyways, that's all for me for now, thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, I'm Captain BB, signing out.